Welcome to Inside Healthcare. Over 42,000 people were killed in automobile crashes last year, marking the deadliest year on America's roads since 2005. These deadly crashes were caused by excessive speeding, alcohol use, and distracted drivers. Later in the program, we'll tell you about one deadly Minnesota car bike accident that was caused by a distracted driver who killed a young Minnesota mom and nearly killed her two little girls who were just on a June morning bike ride near their home. Dr. Craig Maddox has advice on preventing summer-related injuries that they see in the urgency room. Here's Dr. Maddox. When the heat's out, people are out and you know they get exposed to the sun so sun related injuries sunburn usually first degree right where the skin just gets really red but occasionally second degree where you'll see some superficial blistering um, those are common things that we see when people are out in the sun and then heat exhaustion rarely heat stroke but heat exhaustion is where you've spent most of the day outside you know, with the adult population, sometimes there's alcohol involved, which people forget is the, is a diuretic. So it actually promotes urination and dehydration. And if you're not keeping up with substances other than alcohol, you can find yourself in a situation where you're dehydrated, you've been outside all day and you haven't been taking care of yourself and then you feel lousy. And so most of the time, removing yourself from the heat exposure, getting into a cooler environment and rehydrating yourself is sufficient. But occasionally people have, you know, missed that opportunity, don't understand what their symptoms are from or are um, really sick. And so then they end up coming in for evaluation. And in that setting, again, we, we tend to try to cool people off and mostly rehydrate them. They feel quite a bit better with the hydration. And some of those symptoms, is it like a headache? Is that some of the mm -hmm. early signs of dehydration. Yeah. Yep. Headache, nausea, um, lightheadedness. Um, and then of course, at, as heat exhaustion and the heat uh, exposure escalates, you can have confusion. Um, so some stroke-like symptoms uh, can be present where people are having difficulty walking or uh, talking or thinking clearly. Um, and those are, those are worrisome findings that do require immediate attention as as you would think with anybody who, you know, you encounter who's confused and having difficulty you know, communicating or, or, or handling themselves. It seems like we need to be concerned also with some of the older population and also the kids. That mm -hmm. I can't, kids can't always tell you what's wrong with them or the seniors, maybe they're not feeling it as well. Well, certainly we, we know that our, our body's ability to regulate um, our temperature, and our adaptation to extremes of temperature, both cold and heat, that declines as we age. Um, also, as we age, we find ourselves on medications that might contribute to um, complications related to ex you know, extended time in the sun or dehydration or might make us more prone to dehydration. And then you're absolutely right with children, you know, they tend to just play till exhaustion, which, um, can get them into trouble and they don't always have the words for explaining how they're feeling. Um, and so we'll often see these kinds of presentations sort of late in the day, early evening, as the evenings wound down and somebody isn't just quite back to themselves um, when they're around their families. So when should they go seek emergency care then if they have any type of symptoms like you've mentioned? I think, I think predominantly it would be around symptoms that they can't manage. So short of having neurologic symptoms, headache and nausea, not being able to maybe hydrate yourself orally because of the nausea, that would be an indication for evaluation. Um, but if, if you have neurologic symptoms, you're confused, you can't speak, um, you're lethargic, um, those are absolute emergencies. And may best be served by going straight to an emergency department. Fortunately, in the urgency room, we have trained ER physicians working in that non-emergency setting. And so they do have the ability to recognize more serious clinical conditions beyond just heat exhaustion or heat stroke um, early and can navigate people to the right level of care. Um, not all urgent cares have that capacity. And so if, if someone is confused um, or, or lethargic, difficult to wake up, 
uh, that's an emergency that may require 911 or you know directly uh, being taken to the emergency department in a, in a private vehicle, sort of just depending on the circumstances and your ability to get them there safely. You know, the other thing I remember too from last June in particular too, that not only do we have those extreme hot temperatures, but then we also had smoke from the Canadian fires mm -hmm. or California fires that mm -hmm. people were telling me they were having problems trying to breathe even. Right. No more activity that it was difficult. So another concern I would think for anyone that's out and about. Right. I mean, you, you know, we, we encounter all kinds of different environmental um, triggers for us, wh whether it be smoke or allergens that trigger our underlying seasonal allergies or our asthma, right? And then we get symptomatic with itchy, watery eyes and stuffy, runny nose that's, you know, then sometimes hard to tease out is this a, a new respiratory, upper respiratory tract infection, or is it just seasonal allergies? And so again, uh, it's sort of both the constellation of symptoms that patients have and the exposures that they may be able to reference that help us understand which side of that coin we're dealing with. And certainly, you know, environmental triggers, uh, making it harder for people to breathe um, are the ones that they've encountered before, likely last season um, with seasonal allergies or environmental exposures if they're around a campfire or smoke from wildfires that you know have occurred in the in the west and, and north of us that blow our way with the summer winds. No, another thing too I remember as well that we had um, sadly you know a couple of drownings early in the summer last year and, and involving children and at the lakes at the pools um, any advice that you would give to families out there to to be preventable, you know, deaths? Swim lessons. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I you know, I, you can't live in the land of 10,000 lakes without knowing how to manage yourself around, you know, bodies of water, whether they're natural or man-made. And so I think, you know, the earlier you can get your kids trained on how to handle themselves in the water, the better. And if if you haven't had that opportunity, either because of timing or finances. Uh, vigilance is the other element, right? I mean, kids wander off. You have to keep track of your, your kids. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier about heat exhaustion, you know, people like to celebrate the summer with alcoholic beverages and that can impair judgment. Um, and people forget that they can't swim or people get in over their head and they're tired and get into trouble. So it's, you know, just being vigilant about the people you're with um, and your level of uh, awareness to the, the needs in your immediate vicinity of people who may, may be getting into trouble and, and trying to prevent that from happening. Of course, if you know these are home pools, having the appropriate safety measures in place so that your toddler doesn't wander out unattended and fall in, um, that's a, a nightmare cement scenario, unfortunately, that we tend to see yearly um, and that seems relatively avoidable um, with the with the proper safety equipment around the pool and vigilance of your toddlers. Next we talked with Dr. Chrissy Holm, a psychologist with Premier Sports Psychology on advice to help kids and athletes struggling with mental health and sports. We asked how can you tell if a young athlete or a kid is mentally struggling? I think when parents are trying to assess if they're if their child is struggling mentally, um, typically they have kind of a sense that something's off. And I think mm -hmm. trusting trusting that, you know your, your child best. Um, but some other indications if, if something, uh, if they're struggling mentally would be, are they not enjoying activities that they typically would? So let's say uh, they typically spend a lot of time with their friends. They go out, they ride bikes, uh, you know, hang out. And now they're spending a lot more time alone and, and aren't speaking up as much. Uh, that may be a sign that something's off or uh, we can see in a very tangible way if, if their sleeping is disrupted or they're not eating as much as they normally would or, or eating a lot, a lot more. Um, part of that too is as, as they're growing up developmentally, right? There's, there's going to be those changes, but it comes back to 
as a parent, as a grandparent, um, even as a coach, like, trust your gut that if something is off, that there are uh, people like us at, at Premier Sports Psychology that can really help um, with that. And what would be some of those things that a, a parent or a coach might um, suspect that their the, the student or the athlete is, is struggling, especially in the sports part? What would be some things that they can do to help them? So I think first and foremost, um, modeling that it's okay to talk about mental health, mental wellness. So, you know, what, expressing how you're feeling uh, emotionally can go a long way to showing that to a kid that it's okay. Um, unfortunately, there's there's still a little bit of a mental a stigma to, with mental health and seeking mental health treatment. Um, but there is that can that can look so different depending on what a child is experiencing. Um, at Premier Sports Psychology, we we look at working with a client kind of on a spectrum from mental health to mental performance. And if kind of the baseline is right in the middle, uh, if your child is experiencing anxiety, they're worrying about failing both in their sport or in school or you know socially uh, worried about that, you know, there's there's things that we can do to help treat them and work with them to build up those skills to get to, to kind of to get to baseline. And then if there's an athlete um, or a child who's looking to optimize their performance, right, then we can work on some of the mental performance aspects of focus and building confidence and getting that, that mental edge. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we can do depending on what the child needs. And I think it, it starts first with having that conversation and modeling that it's okay to talk about it and that it's okay to reach out to, to resources uh, like ourselves. It seemed like during the Olympics, we were hearing that from athletes. And I think that was really opening to athletes of all ages and all um, sports and things like that. So when you're talking about increasing their mental um, performance, I mean, how, does, how, do you do, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so I think sports are such a wonderful avenue for learning not only how to perform under pressure, but life skills. And so whether it's they, they want to be able to focus more, I know focus is a, a huge challenge for many of us when we're connected to our phones and there's a million things going on. Um, I think the attentional bandwidth nowadays is like four seconds or something unbelievable like that. So helping helping a, a child, helping an athlete of, of all ages, you know, youth, eight to 10 to all the way up to professional level and adults, we work on training focus very often. Make sure that they're not only able to hold their attention on, on something, but knowing what to focus on and sussing that out can can be have a huge impact on performance um one myth is that we can multitask it's not true we go from task to task to task so being able to put all of our effort and, and attention into one thing can give you that that mental edge um or working on how do i how do i get comfortable being uncomfortable Again, sports is a, a great job of whether it's the physical aspect of that or the mental aspect, you're growing, right? You're stepping outside of your comfort zone and, and inevitably it's, it's not always going to feel good. But how do we start to shift that appraisal of, oh, this is hard to, hey, this means that I'm, I'm getting better. And what we see is that the more we can train that, the more that we can accept that growing is uncomfortable, the, the more motivated they are, the more that they uh, persevere and, and really keep at it. And those are two examples of the many ways that we can help athletes great, gain that, that mental edge, but also build those resilient life skills as well. 
Finally, we rebroadcast an interview that we conducted several years ago here on Inside Healthcare with the Minnesota State Trooper about the dangers of texting while driving. We share an incredible story that we first showed you in 2015 about a deadly crash caused by a distracted driver who on one June morning killed a young Minnesota mom and nearly killed her two little girls who were just on a morning bike ride together near their home. Here's their story. We were the perfect match. We were soulmates. She loved her family more than anything. We'll miss her forever. It should never have happened. I can still see her laying on the side of that road. This is going to follow me for the rest of my life. It's tough. It's tough. I made a mistake that day that I can never take back. It's lonely. Very lonely. I remember the day of the crash, it was June 30th and uh, Andrea had the day off um, and was going to spend it with our girls that day. I was in one of our grain bins and uh, um, all of a sudden my mom called on the two-way and said, Matt, where are you at? And I could hear it on her voice that something was uh, uh, very wrong because mom said the Andrea and the girls were in an accident and I knew they were on the bike so I knew it wasn't going to be good. We went out to the crash site. It was difficult. I could see they were uh, doing CPR on Andrea. Uh, I was kind of collecting my thoughts and saying some prayers, and then uh, the fire chief came and said that, uh, that we had lost Andrea, and uh, it was tough. And the shock started. Uh, and then I remember the phone call uh, coming in um, and saying that I had to get to the hospital. My little Claire, who was four at the time, was not okay. She had uh, five broken ribs and a punctured lung and uh, some um, crack vertebrae in her neck. And uh, she was intubated to see that little girl with the tubes and uh, everything. It's just something no father should ever have to go through to see the fear in your four-year-old's eyes and the quivering of her lip just is, is beyond anything that anyone should have to go through. I think she knew mom was gone, but yet, as a father, you still had to tell her her mom was gone. That day when Andrea was riding her bike, she was doing everything right. But Chris that day was doing something unsafe. He was looking at his phone and ultimately hit my girls, and it, uh, it hurts. I don't know what I was doing for that second where I did not see her. Besides, I knew I was on my phone. I remembered that I had to make a payment on a loan, and I thought, oh, what better time to do it now? If I forget, um, I won't remember to do it later. And so I decided to pick up my phone and started dialing. Next thing I knew is I heard a thud. I don't know if I looked down on my phone for a split second, and I heard a thud. And I looked up in my rearview mirror, and I saw a bicycle. And I knew right away it wasn't good. I never saw her one time. I stopped the vehicle as quick as I could. I started running back towards the bicycle. 911, where's your emergency? There's a girl in the bed, I think they hit by a car. We need, they're not, they need, like, you need the ambulance? They're not breathing good at all. We need an ambulance or something really fast. Like, she's not breathing. My, uh, my thoughts were, uh, what the hell have I done? How did I, how did I not see her? No doubt in my mind, it was my fault. I was on the phone, I was driving. I was in control. It was my fault. Mr. Weber, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have a lawyer present now or any time during questioning. Were you a driver involved in this collision? 
Yes, I was. The military is, is taught me one thing, is honesty, integrity. That's who I am. It was my fault. So it's fair to say you were looking at your cell phone. Yes, it, it would okay. be fair to say it could be. I don't remember being looking at myself. I remember being on my cell phone when it happened. Did you have time to apply your brakes? Um, no, I did not have time. I, I didn't even see the gal. I don't like to fail. That day I felt like I failed. I failed number one because I was on my phone. I was distracted that day. Number two, I failed because I could, couldn't keep her alive. We miss her. The hugs, the touches, the smile, the laughs. She loved her family more than anything. She loved her kids. She'd do anything for her kids. In fact, uh, Andrea's last uh, night here, she slept with Claire all night. She was just taking care of Claire one last time. Um, Andrea and I were going to, uh, we wanted more kids. We even talked about adopting someday. But those dreams were shattered. We were the perfect match. We were soulmates. And it's just hard going on without her and waking up every morning to, uh, to an empty home and an empty bed just because there's just one person missing. I like before this crash. Um, 26 year old, <laughs> loving life. Um, got two kids. Then I made that bad choice. Pick up my cell phone that day, make that call. <laughs> that choice that I can't take back. And it killed somebody because of that. When I learned Chris was on his phone, it didn't surprise me. I knew the person responsible for Andrea's crash was on her phone even before I was told. I'm thankful that I've got my girls because the day of the crash, they were involved in it and it could have been a lot different. I could have lost everything. I'm terribly sorry for, for what I did that day. My actions can't be changed and I feel terrible that I made that bad choice. It does, it does make it easier that he's taking responsibility for it, but it still doesn't bring Andrea back. And I know that's what he would want, and I know that's what I'd want. It's what we'd all want. Um, that's why we gotta get the word out there. This doesn't need to happen to anyone ever again. He made a mistake, a mistake in his life that he's gonna have to live with for the rest of his life, just as we are going to have to go on with our life without Andrea, without my wife, the love of my wife, um, the role model to her two girls. What I ask for everybody to do is think about when you pick up your cell phone in your vehicle, is that cell phone worth more than somebody's life next to you? Everybody's got to change their habits. Phones are a habit. They're a bad habit, especially when you're behind the wheel. Yeah, they make life easier, but they made life tougher for us. There's no uh, text or phone call that is that important. I still think it's a big dream, but every morning when I wake up, she's still not here. So put the phone away. We're pretty good butterfly watchers now. Anytime we're seeing a butterfly, whether it be me or Claire, butterflies remind me of, of mom and that mommy is sending these butterflies from, uh, from heaven for us to see. And uh, we stop and take a moment and, uh, and just watch the butterflies. We miss her forever. We'll miss her forever. And we're very pleased to have with us Lieutenant Tiffany um, Nielsen. Thank you so be for being with us. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me. Well, that every time I see it, it just mm -hmm. breaks my heart for everyone involved. W why did the State Patrol decide to do this video and put it together? Well, the, the story is so 
devastating. And I think a lot of people could relate to any person in the story. They could be Matt Bovey, they could have lost their wife, they could be Chris Weber who chose to pick up a phone and check a bank message, check a text, check an email while driving. And I think the story, people can put themselves into the story and understand that this could be their life, this could happen to them. And knowing that, make a decision to not put yourself in that position, to not put another family in that position and make a decision. And what we'd really like people to do is make a decision before they're affected, before they could go through a tragedy. You have a lot of control over your personal choice and decision making and operating a motor vehicle at 50, 60 miles an hour comes with a lot of responsibility. And making that decision to put the phone away and not letting yourself be distracted by that could prevent this from happening to another family. How serious of a problem is distracted drivers or texting or phone using the phone while driving? Well, we know distractions aren't new to drivers, but what is new is all the technology that drivers have access to. You know, our cell phones are computers now. We've got access to the internet. We've got access to email. We've got access to all these applications with instant messages, photographs, and there's a lot of cognitive research that's being done that tells us that our brain can't multitask. We think we can but the reality is we cannot. You cannot do multiple things simultaneously and do all those things well. And so if you're compelled to look at a phone, look at a text or an email, you are gonna be taking your ability away to handle that motor vehicle safely. And so by using barriers, maybe put a phone in a purse or a briefcase. If you've got a passenger in a vehicle, yep, designate a passenger to mm -hmm. operate the phone. I mean, we maybe need to come up with some new solutions because Drivers feel compelled to check, and that checking, like in this case, it's a fraction of a second and somebody's life is, is lost and changed. And a fraction of a second, I mean, how, what kind of distance can you be traveling in that short time if you're going mm -hmm. 65, even now 70 miles an hour on some of that? If highways? you were going 55 miles per hour and look down at a text, which we estimate is two to four seconds that somebody would check the phone, you're covering several football fields. Oh my and gosh. You would, and you would never drive blindfolded. That's, you know, you would never put a blindfold on an operated vehicle, but by looking down, looking away, that's essentially what you're doing. And um, I think before you were saying about a fourth of all of the Mm -hmm. Fatalities or accidents? We know distractions play a role in 25% of crashes in Minnesota, but we also believe that number is underreported, and that's just due to the technology. You know, we go to a fatal or serious crash, we can investigate, search cell phone records, subpoena, you know, phone companies to get that information, but if we go to a two-vehicle rear-end collision, we can't spend the hours and hours of time. We're gonna go on admissions, we're gonna go on maybe if a witness saw something happening at the crash. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our crashes, especially in the metro, are rear-end collisions. Now, you know, when areas get congested, you can slow down, anticipate that, but if you're distracted, there's a high likelihood you're gonna rear-end somebody in front of you. And do we always know that the cell phone was used? The answer is no. But likely, there was something going on that distracted that driver from being able to stop appropriately. You know, I know people feel compelled. There's a lot of temptation. I want them to make a choice before they go through something. So if watching this, if relating to Andrea Bovey's story, her loss of life can help them make a choice, that's what Matt Bovey wants. That's what Chris Weber wants. They want people to learn and experience this without having to go through it put it away, make a good decision, and speak up. You know, if you have a, a parent or a child, a teen driver, you know, be a vocal point for them too, to mm -hmm. and support them in making the decision to not text, use the phone, and all those things while driving. And share this video with yes. friends. Yes, Facebook, we, we want viral. people to see it. The more people who see it can put themselves into the story and hopefully make a good choice because they've um, learned from the Bovey family and from Chris Weber. Well, thank you, Lieutenant, for being Thanks with for us. having me, yes. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.